there's tool, tools to help us grow our amazing potential. I think it's so incredibly important to understand all the time <clears throat> this point in Buddhism. It's not just a question of learning how to calm down and feel a bit better, you know, which is nothing wrong. It's a long-term thing. Buddha's view about our extraordinary potential. And, it's, it's, and when we understand that, it's very encouraging. So we know that we're a work in progress and it's one step at a time, not just instant instant change, instant something, you know, it's long term. So, yeah, and why we do all that? So we can become, this Buddha would say, we've got the potential to be fully developed in virtue and fully rid of all the rubbish. Another word for that is Buddha. And of course, the reason you do it is because it's your natural state, but then of course you're qualified to help others by that point, because you've got this extraordinary compassion and empathy with others and only want to help, because we're all in the same boat. So we talk all the time about attachment and aversion, these simple, simple, simple words, you know, but this is kind of at the root of daily, day-to-day -day practice, and at the root as far as Buddha's concerned of why we're miserable, you know. It almost sounds too simple to be true. Attachment and aversion. We, in a sense, run between these a thousand times a day and the source of so much of our pain. So attachment is, is thinking, speaking simply in a multitude of ways. It's this emotional hunger that only wants everything to be lovely, can't cope with problems, it only wants everything to be nice. And what that means is, putting it in a very self-centered way, it only wants what I want. Because by definition, nice means what I think is nice, isn't it? Not what you think is nice. So of course it's self-centered for that reason. And then when it doesn't get what it wants, aversion arises. It's as simple as that. But it's a thousand times a day and it goes to very subtle levels and very gross levels. So there's a multitude of approaches to how to deal with this. And one of them, it's, it really arises in our life all the time, you know. There's bound to be, isn't it, things we have to do that we don't want to do, jobs we have to do, places we have to go, you know, relationships we have to have, and we don't want them, which means we have aversion to them. It could be a person, a job, you know, a street you have to walk down. It could be anything. Aversion arises because attachment doesn't like it. Attachment only wants something else. So then, of course, this, this causes incredible tension and stress. You know, oh, I've got to go to see my grandmother, and you can't stand the sight of your grandma, you know? She's old, neurotic lady, always complaining, never satisfied, always criticizes you. You don't want to go. Of course not. You have aversion. So then we feel, of course, that the suffering is caused by having to go to see grandma. But it's not. The suffering is caused because you have aversion to it. I mean, this is how we talk all the time. So how to deal with that? Well, one of the one of the approaches is it's almost very simple, but we have to catch it. Is that you know, when you the suffering comes, the suffering comes when we feel victimized by things. We feel like victims so often, and when aversion is there, you feel it's not fair. You know, you're a victim of something, and you feel this is the point. You feel you don't have a choice, so you've got to kind of force yourself to go. A job, being in a relationship with your husband, even people live like this for years. They give up liking the bloke. And then feel you've got to be there every day. So, I mean, talk about tension, unbearable suffering in the mind, you know. And then we have this awful assumption you can do nothing about it. This is the point. We can. We can't see the advantage. We can't see it. We feel in prison. We feel like we're locked and we've got no choice. You have to go see grandma. So we have to unpack it. And there's a multitude of ways to do that. But one of the approaches I'm talking about here is when we have, so then, okay, so it's like this. You, you've got to decide, you have to decide. You've got to make a decision. As opposed to feeling it's put upon you, you don't have a choice. You've been dragged from pillar to post by external circumstances, by other people, by expectations. So you feel imprisoned in it and you feel victimized by it, which is just continues the suffering. But you have to decide, you have to make a decision. Make a decision. And when it comes down to it, which seems almost too brutal when it takes a while to get to this, you've really got two choices, you know. You either choose not to go because you can't cope. And that takes a lot of getting to. That's a scary decision. That's even more scary than choosing to go. 
Because then you've got, oh, my God, I can't not go. I'll have a bad reputation. My mother will freak out. My grandmother will freak out. It's not considered good. I'll be seen as a bad person. And because of our attachment to being seen as a good girl, which is underpinning all the other attachments, we end up not able to make a decision because we're scared of what people think of us. That's a really heavy-duty attachment, that one. It's hard to see it. But bottom line is you've got two choices. You go or you, or you don't go. There's no other choice on the planet. You go or you don't go. And you, the point is, what I'm getting at, just the very action of deciding something, the very action of deciding it. But clearly, there's an added thing here, for the right reason. For the right reason. Deciding something, it, it you cause it to become your own rather than feeling vi victimized by it. There's this thing out there that's dragging you and forcing you to do it. Then you get resentful, upset, and the tension. But if you decide, you make a decision. And of course, to, to be reasonable, no, to be to be to be to be useful to you, it's got to be for a good reason. And that's the tough part, you know. So the decision not to go. Would be, would be, you know, you've got to be aware of the fear of doing that because it's the family, it's your grandmother, for God's sake. How can you not go to your grandmother's house? How can you not go to Thanksgiving? How can you not go to Christmas? You know, you, you can't not do that. We think, we think. And then often when we do decide not to go, it's not, it's not useful because it's out of anger. That just makes it worse. That just makes it worse. It's resentful and bitter and angry and you blame, you know. But the, to do it with, for a good reason, which is knowing, let's say you really can't cope. Let's say you're fragile, you're struggling with problems at the moment, and it just freaks you out and you really can't cope. But to get to that decision takes a lot of looking at, a lot of a lot of authenticity, a lot of courage. You know. I mean, it's just like if you're an alcoholic and you're trying to give it up and your grandmother has alcohol there, of course you decide very clearly you won't go because the alcohol's dangerous to you. That's clear. And in a sense, people would understand that. But here we're just discussing if you're not able to cope with your grandma's energy. You don't blame your grandma, that's the point. You don't not go because she's an ugly person. You decide you don't go because you know it's right for you at the time, at this moment in time, it's a wise choice for you. That's a really good decision, but that's a very scary decision, I tell you. Because we're so afraid that the worst attachment is, the, the attachment beneath that, like I said, the more pervasive is scared of what people think. We don't want to upset the apple cart. We don't want, we, we even, you know, we don't want people to criticize us. So in the end, we become just paralyzed and we just go and full of resentment and build up even more unhappiness. And then you're mean to your grandma, you feel like she's pushing you around and it just makes more and more suffering, more and more suffering. This is the world, you know. It can be anything, your job, anything, relationship with your sister, the event you're supposed to go to. It's the same thing all the time. So what and what causes the suffering initially is this attachment. This is what it's saying. Attachment is the main cause of our suffering. So attachment, in this case, is just this yearning, this craving, this unhappy emotional hunger to just get, have nice feelings. And that means to get the nice things. That means to have, that means the events out there, because we think the happy feelings come from events. It's got to be an event that makes me feel happy. It's got to be a food that makes me happy. It's got to be a person that makes me happy. It's got to be the weather that makes me happy. It's got to be an object that makes me happy. It's very, it's totally self-centered. But it's how it is. We're all, we're all driven by this. So the second you meet a person, a thing, an event, the weather, the food that is not what your attachment wants, aversion arises. And there's this, then there's this tension between these two, you know, and then misery is there. So we're knowing our minds, working on our minds every day and trying to identify this attachment, which is very hard. And then seeing, because of our life and the, the, the way it is, and we have certain responsibilities, there are things, things we think we need to do. So the point is, you've decided you will go to see grandma. You've decided you will go to Thanksgiving. You've decided you will stay in that job a bit longer, because you look at the option and you know, you really feel as you know you have you made you've owned it and made a decision. Yes, I should go. And then instead of should meaning from other people pushing you, you make it you make it to yourself out of a, for a good reason that I have decided you own it and think it is a good thing to go. I will go to see grandma, which means in a way. You, you feel you can handle it, but also it's out of kindness to the other person. But it doesn't have to be even the kindness. The job, for example, you know, you hate your job. Let's say it's lousy pay, might be true. The boss might be miserable. The colleagues might be horrible. The tasks might be boring. All they, might, they all might be facts. So the usual one is 
You, you go grudgingly with a version in your mind, and that's where the tension is. You have a version to it, so you force yourself to go and just building up the aversion, and eventually, or it's depression to the point where you can't move because there's this terrible tension that's caused. Doing something with aversion is the most horrible experience, but we don't think we have a choice. So you've got to make this choice. So first you look at the option. Okay, it is a horrible job. Maybe conventionally it might be true. So you decide, well, can I leave? And that's, again, the scary part. It might be because of reputation. It might be because you think you're not going to get another job. You've got no security. You might lose your money or you might lose your house. And you're terrified to even make the decision, I get another job or even just to leave it. You're too scared. So you're paralyzed. Oh, I can't. No, no, no. I can't leave the job, you'll say. You don't even consider the possibility. So you're getting this tension. But then you, your friend says, well, you know, Rabina, you could change your mind about it. And given that you can't really have, you've decided you can't leave the job, maybe you decide, you decide, but you will do the job. That's what I'm trying to get at. The decision that I will do the job suddenly open, suddenly changes everything because you choose it. You own it as yours. And as soon as you do this, you, you, you relax into it more. You maybe even start to see good things about it because you've chosen it. You've chosen it, not resentfully, not bitterly, not feeling like you're being dragged there by circumstances. You become, you own it and not, not feeling like a victim. Attachment's like a completely victimized. <clears throat> An aversion, how dare that happen to me? I don't deserve it. It's how it feels, you know? Like as if life happens to us. We've got to own life. That's the point I'm getting. It's very tough. That's why my friends in prison are so outrageous. That's good examples. They can't possibly walk out of prison. They don't even have that choice. They don't even have that choice. We have that choice, even though we might as well be in prison, because we really believe we don't have that choice. We really believe we can't leave work. We really believe you can't leave that relationship. We really believe it utterly. But so we stay, we continue with aversion and build up all this stress and go crazy, you know, and then blame everybody else. I mean, we are like infants, you know. This is because of attachment and our fears. The people in prison don't have a luxury. Well, as I always quote my friend Sunny, I couldn't, I realized I couldn't change anything, but I, they couldn't take my mind from me. So she changed her mind. She chose, in other words, she chose to stay in prison. Put it like that. She chose. Or another way to put it is she accepted the reality. When we say acceptance, it sounds like passivity to us. We've got to accept it. Like shut up and put up with it. No, that's aversion. Just, that's just passive aggression. Owning it is a nice way to put it, you know. You decide, I am in prison, I am in this cell, and I can't get out. Fact. But as she said, they couldn't take my mind from me. So she changed her mind. And what was the consequence? She owned it. It was like she was choosing to be in prison. And that's really a good way to put it. So you decide you're going to do that job. I choose to go to work. And when you choose it, everything changes. You're not functioning out of aversion and frustration and victim victim mentality. It's huge. It's totally possible. You've just got to have courage to do it. That's all. I'm going to be aware of our minds. Because there's always going to be things we don't like. It's just natural. Throughout the day, there's a thousand things a day that happen that your attachment doesn't want. And we and we have aversion to it. It builds up the tension, you know, every second. A thousand times a day. No wonder by the end of the day you're exhausted. So another way of putting it in a micro sense, not in this macro decision, but in micro moments, day, moment by moment, you know. You get a cup of tea, someone offers you a cup of tea and it's half cold. Aversion arises. Victim, how dare you offer me cold tea? You drink it grudgingly, you know. The cause of suffering. Bad enough having cold tea while being miserable as well, is the way I like to put it. So you decide it's fine. That's choosing it. You're choosing to drink the cold tea. It's another way of putting it. It's another way of putting it. And that counteracts his aversion and counteracts that, 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 that tension in the mind and that suffering and that misery. It's huge, but it takes courage. It takes courage to do that. If you can change it, you know, then fine. Go back to the counter at Starbucks and say, I did, I did ask for 180 degrees. Can I have it? I know. Fine. But not out of resentment. I asked for 180 degrees. Give me 180 degrees. Not like that. Or you can be patient and just put up with it and decide, choose to drink cold tea. I mean, in other words, we've got the, we've got the, other words, in other words, whatever happens, good or bad, which is determined by attachment and aversion, you can just, you can choose it. You can accept it. And acceptance, like I said, is not passivity. It's a powerful state of mind. Except we think passivity, therefore you can do nothing about it. So Sunny, all those 17 years she was on, in, or 12 years on death row and 17 years in prison, 
at whatever point it was in those years, I don't know, that she went through this process of realizing she couldn't change anything. So started to work on her mind. The interesting point was because she didn't go mad, which is what aversion of causes, I uh, this victim, it's not fair, how dare they do this to me, which is reasonable. If people go mad in certain circumstances like that. But she didn't. She owned it. And then the interesting point was she didn't, she so she accepted the reality, but she wasn't passive. She didn't go, oh well, I'm in prison, I'll sit back and put my feet up and just wait till I die. No. She did her yoga, she, she learned to talk yoga, she taught herself yoga, she did her own exercise to help her mind, stop being angry, all these kind of things, slowly, slowly, really intense. But the point is, because she kept her sanity, it was still unjust what happened, she was completely not, not, not guilty. So she'd just sit there passively accepting it. She accepted she couldn't change it at this moment, but she worked on herself and then made herself sane, and then she worked on her freedom, and she got it eventually. But if you go out of your brain, you go to work with this bitterness and resentment. You'll go crazy one day and you can't see any options. You just can't see past your own nose. You're overwhelmed by, your, by the suffering and the misery. But as soon as you own it and choose to go, your mind is more open. Your mind is more free. And then you'll start to see other options. You'll even see better things about the job. And then another day, another job will come along and you'll see it. You know? But if you're frozen and miserable in misery and passivity and hopelessness and despair and anger and victim... You can't see past your own virus. Nothing can change. All this is the same as we talk all the time, giving up attachment, giving up aversion. But a multitude of approaches to it, and one might work better for our minds. You know? But it takes intense hard work to do this. And again, remember, it's not just so you can be seen to be a good girl, aren't you good at practicing hard? You are the beneficiary. This is how to make yourself happy. This is how to make yourself not go crazy. It's a method for you to be less neurotic, that's all, for your own sake. Of course, it benefits others as well, but here it's totally for your own sake. If you've chosen, if you do, I mean, you, but, but the point is, you've got to decide, and that's the part that's tough. That's the toughest part. That's the part that's tough. No, 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 I can't leave the job. Not possible. I'll never get another job. No, 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 not possible. Well, you know, you could change your mind about it. I mean, no, 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 not possible. Can't change your mind. The boss is horrible. Then you're stuck. And that's the majority of human beings. That's how we are. No wonder we go crazy. We don't think we have choice, but the miracle is we do. But it's intensely difficult to take it because we just want it to be the way we want. And in blame, we want it the way we want and we want to blame. Blame is another word for anger. How dare you do that to me? Oh, I don't deserve it, you know. It's the innocent victim. It sounds heavy because life is tough. Life is terrible. Terrible things happen. No question. But this is the point. I mean, it's what, literally what my book talks about liberation. You know, this is what he means by liberation. The process of being on the step to getting liberated from this nightmare of suffering and its causes. It's exactly, this is the modern way of talking about what he's saying. Two and a half thousand years ago, you know. Choose. You don't want to go to Thanksgiving, you just choose. Can't bear to see your old grandma, you choose it. Or you choose not to go. You've only got two options. This is the point that's so outrageous. It's so annoying and infuriating to think this. You can't, you can't wriggle out of it, you know? You have two options. Choose not to go, but for the right reason. Not out of bitterness and anger, but for the right reason. I really can't cope. And that takes courage, but you might get criticized. You've got to be prepared for that. Or you decide you'll go. You're going to go for an hour to see your neurotic old grandma. Instead of building up all the tension in your mind beforehand, which is half the suffering, you decide, okay, I'm going to go. You leave your ego at the door. You walk in the door. I'm here, Grandma, and I'm yours for an hour. Do what you like with me. Suddenly, you'll enjoy it because there's no aversion. There's no resistance. Aversion is resisting. Aversion is pushing away. You know, That's what causes so much exhaustion, so much suffering. Aversion. The volatile level is called anger. The mild level is frustrated, upset, irritated, annoyed. We all use those words all the time in daily life. That's anger, but at a mild level. It's pushing it, it's resisting it. It doesn't want it, it doesn't like it. Go away, leave me alone. You know? That's what builds up the tension. That's what causes the suffering. Not your grandma. Not your grandma. Your mind, your aversion. But of course you've got to know like just like the alcoholic one, if you are an alcoholic and you haven't you haven't organized it yet, you're still under the threat, you're still overwhelmed by it. You must protect yourself. 
and not go to grandma's. You know that. Well, it's the same here. If you've got so much anger and rage or despair or you're fragile right now, then you can't cope with the pressure, then you don't blame grandma. You don't blame the alcohol. You say, I can't go and let her accept it. And she, she might not. She might get angry with you, but you accept that. So you've got to have courage. Either decision you make, you've got to have courage. It means owning your own responsibility for what you think and do. It's very, very, very powerful. It's another way of talking about giving up the Catholic and aversion. Buddha doesn't say it like in the text, like I'm saying it. It's exactly the same. It's how we talk in the modern world, you know. But what it demands is an understanding from the Buddhist perspective of what attachment and aversion are, because the word sounds so cute. These are primordially deep as far as the Buddhist view is concerned, you know. They go to such subtle levels, way more subtle than we can imagine in our modern psychological views. So this is the secret to success. Yeah, I talk. Um, so I have a question. So you don't want to go to grandma's because yeah. of all those things and your aversion to it. But is like choosing not to go a different form of attachment? No, I'm saying do it for the right reason. So, okay, excuse me, would you would you accept that it's valid not to go near alcohol if you're an alcoholic? Yes. So that's not attachment, it's intelligence. That's intel sure that's intelligence, because you know your you know your own weaknesses. You know that you're in danger. Would you accept that? Well, here it's exactly the same, whether it's alcohol or attacking to or aversion to something, attacking to aversion are both delusions. So you know that one object is very powerful and will trigger your attachment, so you've got to keep away from the object. When well, you know your grandma is triggering your anger really violently, you don't blame grandma, but you know where you're at. You know what you can and can't handle. If you do it just for your own attachment, then fine, it's a bad reason, you won't be happy. Can you see the difference? You can't see. Yeah, well, I mean, it's subtle. No, no, it's I quite clear. I do it because I want something for myself is that no but listen no 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 you're misunderstanding so you're making it too not sunny Sheila you're making it too blanket we're talking the wisdom we hear not just making the compassion wing yet Sheila we're talking about to knowing where you're at and doing what is the wisdom wing which is the first scope and second scope of the lamb ring which is control your body and speech and mind for whose benefit do you think is that do what do you think those teachings are for for whose benefit are those teachings Myself thank you. Then. Thank you. No, no, Sheila, that's the mistake. And that's exactly what we miss in, in the West. We cannot hear it. We just cannot hear it. We just cannot hear it because we think it sounds selfish. That means we completely miss Buddhist teaching. And that's what happens even among Buddhists for years. We think of it as self centered. We think it's only always got to be what's best for others. We don't understand. We've got to go where we're according to our capacity. The wisdom wing is about benefit for you. Karma, why do you think karma? Okay, why do you think in Buddha's instructions, he gives a little list of instructions, suggestions, don't kill. Why would he say don't kill? What's the reason? Because uh, you generate negative karma. Can't hear you. Because you generate... Uh, they got me English words, not like Buddhists in 11th century. Just say the simple words. Why would Buddha... What's the reason behind Buddha's exhorting you not to kill somebody? Because it's harmful to oneself. Thank you very much. You just said it. You just said it. You just said it. So then you avoid doing it because you don't want future suffering. Do you accept that? And then, of course, eventually when you get advanced, you, you also have compassion. That comes second. It, the action of killing is by definition negative because it harms another. But the reason at the beginning Buddha exhorts us not to do is because it's going to harm you. So the same thing, Buddha exhorts you to not drink alcohol and become an alcoholic because it hurts you. So you keep away from the object because you're not strong enough. You have to, then you, you're intelligent, you keep away from the object that will harm you. Do you agree with that? Well, your grandma, you're not blaming your grandma, but she just says she's a crazy neurotic and you've got a tendency to be very angry or very distressed very easily. Do you understand me? Then you keep away from the grandma, not out of anger for her, because you're, you can't handle it like the alcohol. It's intelligent. It's intelligent. It's taking care of yourself according to your capacity. Can you hear it? The whole of the first scope and the second scope, the wisdom wing, is all about what's beneficial for oneself. Given that we're a bunch of neurotics and have to take care of ourselves first, then we can afford to do things for the sake of others. You can't possibly just do it. If you're brave enough, you've got the capacity to put your own needs aside and go to grandma's and give yourself to her for one hour and love her for who she is. Go for it, honey. But you've got to be honest with yourself. The reason we mostly don't go to grandma is because we're angry and don't want to go, which is just another reason to be self-centered. That's not what I'm saying. It's for a good reason. 
according to your capacity. You have to know your mind well. If you don't know you're an alcoholic, you'll be in big trouble. Don't be friends with alcohol. Do you see my point? It's the same thing. We have to be honest with ourselves, not, not pretend you're going for your, you know, you, mostly we just don't, mostly we do everything just because it suits us. We don't go to grandma's because we can't be bothered and screw grandma. That's not a virtuous reason. That's not what I'm saying. Do you understand my point? That demands a lot of authenticity and knowing your mind and doing it for a valid reason because you really know you can't handle all the crazy family at, at Thanksgivings. You've got to be brave to do that. Most of us, are, if we are that neurotic and that stressed because we're, you know, because we're really having a nearly like having a mental breakdown, then you must be intelligent. But if you're just being self-centered, excuse me, go to Thanksgiving, put your ego at the door, walk in and just serve people and be happy. See grandma, grandpa, drunk or uncle, offer them a cup of tea and walk out the door. But you decide because you know you can do it. Do you understand my point? That's what I'm talking about here. The reason, the only reason we ever do anything is attachment. But because it might suit us, because we're attached to our family, we think, aren't we lovely going to Thanksgiving? No, because it suits you. As soon as it doesn't suit you, I mean, look at people giving up their, their mums and dads. I mean, I'm always shocked by to have people, nice human beings with their own children and their own wife, who literally have given up their mother. I can't, I think it's insanity. I mean, she's not even that bad. You know, she's not like she's a drunken and psychotic. She's an old, happy, you know, an erotic old, an erotic old person. I, I'm shocked by that. If that's not self-centered, I don't know what is. She's not, it's not doing it for a good reason. It's because it doesn't suit you. Borrow the neurotic old mother. Just forget her, you know. I'm blessed my mum, that. Are we communicating? The, most, the only reason we ever do anything is just because it suits me. We think we're nice people. And that's why when we call it a relationship, if I'm in love with him, you know, and we, and we what do they call it in, in, in America, in, in English, codependent. It's a great way of putting it. He's attached to me, I'm attached to him. We prop each other up in our attachment and we look like we're so loving. We're not being loving. We're just feeding our own junkie minds out of each other, sucking each other dry, you know. And as soon as he stops loving me, then he's a monster and I want to kill him. Now he's stalking me, you know. <laughs> That's it. But it suits both of us. We'll be, we'll be, and look so loving, but it's not loving, it's attachment. That's that. It's really very wicked. We're so wicked, you know. And you know yourself how disgusting it is when you've stopped being attached to the boyfriend and he's still attached to you. It's disgusting. You can't stand the sight of that person. You understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying here? When a person's all over you, we say in Australia, when a person's all over you like a rash. <laughs> you understand? There's nothing, but, but if, if he and I love each other, we are happy to be all over each other like a rash. Because it's mutual. I'm sure it's that disgusting attachment, isn't it? Ooh. Are we communicating, people? Any questions? Come on. Alone is good for a question. Eileen is good for a question. And there are two questions in the room, so you come second. Go on. Uh, what about the limitation of time? Speak louder, darling. What about the limitation of time, Grams 96? I have to get oh. you to say it again. I missed you completely. Uh, like, how the limitation of time? Uh, limitation of time. I'm not ready, Grams 96. How much about time? who? Uh, the, say it again. So the limitation of time, Grams 96. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm not ready. For what? To go to Grandma's house because she doesn't have any people around her. No, I'm really lost a bit now. You have to oh, give me the scenario. So I it's different. It's so different. Yeah. I was <laughs> trying to be very simple. And it's not happening. Um, so so my grandmother has 13 children. So your grandma what? Has 13 children. Okay, good. And they live on a farm. Yes. In okay. And she they all live with grandma. Yeah, and I don't drive. So when I go there. Your grandma's got 13 children. Your mother or father and. My what? mother's mother, yes. And her, and all your mother's 13 siblings all live with grandma. Well, not all, but in the vicinity. So then go on. So the question is the point is. Uh, it's not safe sometimes for me either. Uh, what do you not think? Because of grandma, but because of there's. That's an army of people to me. Sometimes. What? I watch. That's an army of people there. Like, and what's wrong with that for you? You can't. Uh, it's is, that, safe. is that fragile? Uh, it, it feels like there's a lot of um, gossiping. Of course there is, but that's, that's their problem, not yours. Yeah. You're about your mind. Yeah. So, okay, so stop, stop, stop. The reason, what would be the reason that you even would consider to go and see Grandma? Uh, Out of kindness to her, isn't it? Well, that's why I love her. What? I love her. Well, that's you know, easy. My memories of her are very nice. So then it's out of kindness to Grandma as well. Yeah. So, but you don't go to see Grandma, is what you're saying? Yeah, they're far away, yes. Sorry? They're very far away. But that doesn't, if you were really, if you were really attached, you'd go. So you yeah, Zoom, you phone her, say hello to her, be kind to her for her sake. Uh, you do that? Yeah, I mean, for her sake, but also, you know, she sends me a card every year. What, darling? She sends me a card every year, so she, I think she thinks of me. 
She yeah, but we're talking, we're talking about we're talking about your grandmother. We're talking about you. Yes. Right? So then, would you think you have a, a kind of if you want to look in the ordinary way that people talk about families, you have a responsibility to your grandma because she's been good to you over your life. She's been kind and loving to you. Would you say yes. that? So you surely would like to repay her kindness, which yes. we used to call her every now and again. So how how do you ever do that though? You probably uh, don't. No, I don't. Well then, okay. So now I suggest you have something to look at. Yeah. Don't you think so? Yes, yes, but I also been told by like therapists. And, Sorry, what? I've been told by therapists to you know also like you know take care of myself. Yeah, we know that. I know that. But you're a big boy now. You're not having a mental breakdown. Look at you sitting there. If you're having a mental breakdown, you wouldn't be sitting here like this. You'd be you know on seven drugs and so you're a big boy and you could call your grandma sometimes. There's yes. no surely there's nothing there's nothing dangerous in calling your grandma. Uh, Saying hello to her and telling yes. you love her and thank you for her kindness. That's. That's yes. what I'm getting at. Yes, okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, baby steps. Well, no, better. No, not even just baby steps, but perhaps do any, do, you do, do something. Like, it seems to me you do nothing right now, except you say you love your grandma. Yeah, yeah, I don't do anything. Well, then I'd suggest you should look at that, don't you think? Yes. Especially if the person in your life has been kind to you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Okay, no, I think suggest. Yeah. And I think how happy she'd be just to have a phone call from you or a, a little card in the mail with a gift. Do you ever send her a Christmas card in return? I bet you don't. No. But we take our grandmas for granted. Yes. So that's very cruel of you. Yeah, yeah. Now we're so. getting more deeply into it. Mm -hmm. So how about getting out of yourself? And there's no danger to you to write a card and thank her for her kindness before she dies. She, if you know, before she drops dead. How about that? Yeah. She'd be so touched. And all our grandmas don't expect anything from their grandsons, you know, because they're just used to us being off in our own lives. We never think of them. What do you think? Good idea. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your teaching. Good. Um, I had a question on aversion, and in particular, trying to uh, purify the, the karmic inference that cause us to have aversion. And so, on the the, the remedy step, the third step mm. of the Bhagavad Gita, yes, would you be able to um, speak a little bit about when we do that step, um, how how that might be purifying those future tendencies to okay okay so the real so the, the point about the okay you might notice when you read the instructions in the in the four appointed powers practice it's at the level of the wisdom wing it's right at the level even of body and speech not even at the level of mind the main things the main purpose behind that practice at the level that is taught, which is the very first level of controlling your body and controlling your speech. It's all about behavior. And that is to say, you're regretting the first step, the actions you've done to harm others. Do you understand? Yes. Of your body and your speech. Then of course you can regret the states of mind because they're the ones that are the root problem. So then at that point you'd regret your attachment, your aversion, which are the cause of why you do things to harm others. Of course you would. But the key thing about the purification practice is to protect us from future really heavy duty suffering by, by purifying your actions of body and speech, which are the cause of future suffering of lower realm rebirth, having not see that's why you've got to regret the tendency because that's you you know you've got to want to get rid of the tendency and you want to stop the suffering of the having to happen to you and you want to stop the suffering of the environmental result as well as the lower world reaper so that's the reason you strongly do the bhajan suffer practice but of course you regret the aversion regret the ego grasping regret the attachment of course you do and then when you purify the third step of the remedy you're visualizing saying the mind visualizing purifying with body and speech and mind you pure you visualize it Imagining it, purifying, weakening those tendencies. Do you not understand? In, in that step, when we're the third one, where you the do the visualization step, yeah. and you're visualizing nectar coming from the Sattva and you do the mantra. Well, there are ways of doing it where the first level is you visualize nectar coming and purifying all the karmic tendencies of your actions of the body. Then you do the next lot of mantras, and that, that purifies the tendencies of the actions of your speech, the karmic inputs of the actions of your speech. And the third one is if you're purifying the tendencies themselves, which is attachment, anger, and all the delusions. Do you see? Yes. So it's purifying all. And you just visually imagine purifying, visualizing. And Lama Zopa says the more strongly you do that with confidence, the more you actually do purify. But it's your mind that purifies. And I guess the question would be what is it about, let's say, either the, the mantra, the visualization? Uh -huh. That that the, the logic would say 
purifies. No, it. they don't really purify. Your mind does. It's just your 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 mind purifies. I mean, okay. You're playing. You're you're, you're learning music. Of course, the point is to play it on the piano. But the music is in your mind, right? So the more you internalize the music and then you express it on the piano, the piano isn't making you play music, it's your mind. So a person, you're visualizing the Buddha and you're saying Sanskrit sounds, they have a function because of their power, but the real purification is your mind thinking those things, your mind expressing those things. That's what purifies. But you're just utilizing them as tools. Because your mind, so I mean, yes, he says, we create negativity with our mind. Well, we purify it. We are purified by, by, by you know, we, and we, so we create positivity with our mind. So your mind is the main thing. Because we visualize Vajrasattva, we think Buddha's doing the purifying. No, you're imagining nectar coming. It's just you using your creative imagination. But it's your mind imagining it. It's your mind seeing it. It's your mind wanting it. So your mind is what purifies can you see my point? I mean, if we're Christians, it's very different. If we're Christian, it is God who does purify. It really is God who does purify. But you have to ask God for forgiveness. And forgiveness itself from God is what purifies. Do you see my point? Yes. Not here. It looks similar. You visualize Jesus blessing you. You visualize Buddha blessing you. It's similar insofar as you're utilizing those images. But the Christian one is you've got to have that forgiveness for you to be purified. Otherwise, you're lost. Buddha would purify, Buddha would forgive you as a nice guy. But that's not what purifies you. It's your mind. Can you hear me? Yes. You see the point? I do, thank you. Good. We really mistake that one. You know. Buddha's not purifying. You're just utilizing the visualizations. It's a tool you're using, you understand. It's your mind and your sincerity in doing it and your wish to do it and your and the determination to do it. And even as you say the mantra as well, that's what purifies. Do you see? Yes. It's an important point. Good. Someone online has a question. Sweethearts. Yes, Eileen, darling. Talk to me. Thank you, Rabini, as always. Um, when you said making decisions based on the right reason, yes. that seems to be such a huge core in itself. How do we know what the right reason is? I mean, there are times yeah. I'm well, okay, cool. okay, listen, good good question. Good question, Eileen. Listen, I'll tell you the answer. You're trying to play the piano, okay? And you're asking me, how do I know if I'm playing the right notes? What's your answer? How do, how do I know if I'm playing the right yeah, notes? Exactly. You're, you're asking me exactly that question. How, I, you're saying, how do I know how, what I'm doing if I'm thinking the right things? Well, how do you know you're playing the right notes? How do you know you are playing the right notes? It's a crucial question and it's a really clear answer. How do you know you're playing the right notes? It's not complicated, I mean. Well, you're you'd, learning... have, you'd have to know from studying and- No, from... it's, yeah, I'll, I'll, it's very simple. You're learning to play Bach and you've got to lift your eyes off the keys and look at the notes on your piano. Look at look at Bach's instructions. Yeah, I see. I see what you're then saying. You can, so in other words, this is the point now, playing the right notes is not some self-existent thing that exists in the sky somewhere and you've got to cross your fingers. You just look at the bloody music in front of you because you've decided you're learning Bach's music. Yes. So you're going to abide by the rules of music, which you've, yeah. you've, you've accepted, you want to, and you just follow Bach's instructions. Well, here, we tend to think of our mind as, well, I have to look in the mind and somehow the good thoughts will sort of appear to me in there and it'll say, I'm a good thought, choose me, Eileen. No, it doesn't work like that. So here we are deciding to follow Buddha's approach to virtue and goodness, Buddha's approach to the mind. It's a very precise model, just like yeah. Bach's music is a very precise model of music. It's a huge point for us. It sounds very shocking to think it this way because we think everything's already in my mind. I just have to choose it. No, because if you, you know, so you've got to rely upon, you've got to make first a decision you're going to follow Buddha's view of the mind. You can decide on Jung, you can decide on Freud, you can make up your own view. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? It's not just a random thing. 
So if you're going to learn to, to, to grow a garden, it's exactly the same, Eileen. You don't just look at the garden and without knowing any botany, somehow think that a weed will reveal itself to you. God almighty, of course not. You have to learn botany and you have to learn to know what the definition of a weed is and what the definition of a herb is. And then you use your eyes and you look at the garden, you now can identify a weed from a herb. Same with your mind, baby. Are you hearing me though? Are you hearing me? No, I am. I am. Yes. You it's your decision if you want to follow Bach's view. And then Buddha happened. Buddha would agree pretty much whether a good communist, a good Christian, a good Hindu, or a good Australian Aboriginal will all probably agree that being kind and loving is a virtue. So there's a pretty common ground there. Yes. But if the advantage if you want to follow Buddha's one is a very precise definition of the character of a negative state of mind and the character of a positive one that makes it easier to identify the herbs from the weeds. That's what you use as your basis for choosing, knowing how to see your mind, knowing how to identify the weed from a herd, knowing how to identify the note that would want to play or not play. It's the same principle, sweetheart. It's surprising to us to think this, but it's exactly like that. Are we communicating? Yes. Yes, Rabin. It goes back to the mind, period, that that's what we have to understand what's going on in there in order to make that right decision. No, you have no more than that. You have to learn the theories first. Yes. Eileen. In other words, you just said, how do I know? I could go right back to the beginning again. You just said, how do I know if it's the right decision? Mm -hmm. You've got to distinguish between attachment and, and virtue. You've got to yeah. distinguish between attachment and love, for example. Like I just said to this fella, what's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy, darling. So Jeremy here, Petal Jeremy. Jeremy is saying, you know, he's thinking and deciding out of love, not attachment. Because attachment so far is what caused him to not be bothered to write to his grandma, not even be bothered to thank his grandma for her yearly you know, yearly cards. So he's deciding to go against his attachment and to follow love, which is make grandma be happy, and to do a little action of gratitude to reach out to his grandma. That's that's how you decide. But you've got to know that first. I mean, maybe he's never thought that he's being attached to his own comfort. I don't know, Jeremy, maybe you have, but he maybe never thought of it. But we analyze, you present it, and you go, oh, that's interesting, I might think of that. So you learn the, the learn the, Again, you're like, you just said, I've got to learn my mind. You do. But if you're a gardener, you've got to know your garden. But what is the basis of you knowing your garden, Eileen? I'm asking ask you a question. Well, if I think of the mind, understanding. No! Excuse me. I'm not angry. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm sorry. Oh, I mean, listen to me. Yeah. Let's say you've yeah. never, listen, I mean. All right. <laughs> We don't think like this, you know, but we need to. Listen to me. If you've never heard of botany mm -hmm. and you've never studied it, do you mm -hmm. agree? It's possible, right? Sure. And someone says you should go and be a gardener. And you just, so what you're just saying is, oh, I better go and look at my garden. But what if you look at your garden, but you don't know how to identify what's there, Eileen? Yes. So yes. you're saying, I've just got to look at my mind. I have to you identify. You concluded. But what do you have to do first, Eileen? Mm -hmm. I'm asking you. I, I think the first thing I need to do is identify what's in my mind. No, no, no. you missed the point. I'm missing the You're point. You're saying to me the first step in being a gardener is to identify what's in my garden. But well, if you haven't studied well, botany, how, if you haven't studied botany, how can you identify? What, you have to study. You Thank you. Study what? Botany. The books. The books. Then, you, then you have your definition of a flower or a rose and you look at your garden and you go, oh, there's a rose. Now you can know how to see a rose, isn't it? So how do you know what is love and what is compassion and what is attachment if you just say you hear these different words? How are you going to identify? How do you know how to define them? Well, that's you the, use a person who's got a model of the mind, whichever one you choose to use, and we're discussing Buddhism here. Yes. You would surely learn that. You'd learn theoretically what is attachment and what is love. You'd learn that theoretically. Would you agree with my point? Yes, yes, yes. Then absolutely. when you look into your mind, you can go, oh, I see, there's love. I better start growing it. And there's attachment. I better start giving it up. It's very it's very simple, but we don't think like this. We think of our mind as some absolute thing full of all this wisdom and knowledge and drama. Do you understand? Yes. We think it's just there for us to discover, but we make a mess half the time because we don't even know how to identify what's there, darling. Thank Are you. we communicating, I mean? Yes, I, I have it. Thank you. You better write it down. I, know, I always do. Like, well, as soon as you start talking. 
Uh, it's sort of clear, really, but we don't think of it like this. You understand? Because we think the mind is a special, holy place, you know, the special, special mind, mind. And it's like a little miracle. You look inside, wow, there's love. There's We can't tell one bit from another half the time. Uh, are we communicating or not? Huh? What do you think, Sunny? What? Yeah. I'm looking at you. <laughs> what do you think I said? Don't point to him, I'm pointing to you. What do you think? Well, actually, um, if anyone... I can't hear you, Sunny. We're yeah. both deaf. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Speak actually, louder. Have your oh, good, I haven't got mine in. Go on. Anyway, so um, this is exactly what I'm struggling with right now. So I am listening and I am... Uh, I agree with you that that the, the mind doesn't know everything. You have to study, just like you have to study botany. Question is... What? Question is what? The question is... Yeah. When do you know that you're acting out of... When do you know if you've identified a herb or not? Yeah. Or, <laughs> same thing. Same thing, Sunny. One step at the time. Well, then, then the question is, is how do you deal with the pain in, in between? Like another discussion. You learn to be a big girl, put up with it. <laughs> how do you deal with the weeds and the mud up to your knees? Because you know you've got a garden coming because you're learning and you're prepared to wait for the time. But if you don't have a method, if you don't know botany and you're up to your knees in weeds and shit, of course you'll get depressed. But if you have a method and you know what a flower is, and you know what a weed is, and you've got the vision of what your garden will look like, you will persevere, won't you? Say yes. here. Are we communicating? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Sammy. Yes. Uh, Petal. Um, so my question is, one of the things I've been thinking about lately is, um, so in the last four years, I've-, I've Four or 40? Four. Okay, good. <laughs> since the since the lockdown, uh, I've developed a lot of anxiety. Okay. And sometimes, you know, even trauma. And and I realize sometimes, you know, even like if I walk out my the door of my apartment, I get triggered by other people's behavior. Triggered in what sense? What happened so inside for, you? So, for example, in the hallway, there are two recycling bins, and there's someone. Keeps throwing chicken bones, food scrap, and garbage in the in the. In okay, the good. Then. So anyway, so I'm furious. In okay, it. so so okay, so we'll use the right word. So you say trauma, you say anxiety. So what really means is attachment and anger. We'll use these words in this room. So you walk out the door, and your attachment to get everything to be lovely, which is very strong. You're telling us, like everyone else, gets upset, and it turns into aversion. So then, join the universe. So then, question. Well, so. What I'm, so what I'm saying is I I realize that it is my attachment. My attachment to having how, everything nice. How I want people yes. to behave. Yeah, that's right, exactly. You know? There you go. I and, and you know, and so I it gets to the point where, you know, my heart is racing. All but you can't you can't work on it. You can't kind of you know the theory now am, here sitting in the well, room. What I'm, you what, can't apply what, it. Yeah. What I'm what I'm trying to say yeah. is how do I practice with that other than meditation? You know, like I, at that time. Well, I mean, I think you yeah, understand. I understand. So you mean that the heart? I mean, it's, it's almost visceral even before you start to see the theories in your head. Right. Really. My heart is racing like crazy, and I, you know, almost immediately you see the chicken bones. Your heart races. Yes. Do you, you notice the thoughts first coming in the mind? No. The angry thoughts. Do you notice them? Yes. The, okay. So, so the thought. The thing is, I think I know who it is, but I, I, know, I don't. I don't. No, we don't I worry about that. So we're not worried about that. We're just going to hit your mind. So do you notice when you see the chicken bones or whatever, so it arise, So the upset arises in your mind right. and then your heart beats. Right. But do you notice the thoughts like, how dare he do this? How dare he blah, blah. You notice it or not? Yes. It, so, well, I have tremendous anger towards the person I think it is. So I'm developing all these... There's a story in your head. Yeah. No, I understand, I understand. I mean, this is very common. We all we all do right. this, isn't it? It's a, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because the stories get out of control, don't they? And that's the, t the difficult part. And you think you've gotten worse in the last four years. Is that what you're suggesting? You think you've gotten worse at this in the last four years. Is that what you're suggesting? I, yeah. Well, you know, so my my anger and yes. anxiety of birth yes. have gotten worse. They have. At the same time... Yeah. I am aware. And I see that my feeling is you probably haven't got worse. They all say this in the text. It's very interesting. In the text, 
even the typical instructions on how to get single point of concentration, right? Some shamata. And this is the ancient text, and this is described in nine stages of development. And they all say that even at the first stage, already a sign of success is that we think we're getting worse. We're not. We're becoming aware of what's already always been there. But it seems like, it's sort of like you've been eating crummy food for years, and then you start to go on nutrition. And suddenly you notice you're burping, you notice your indigestion, but it's always been there, you just never noticed before. So be glad that you're seeing it and just keep practicing because you are doing your best. You are just keep practicing and do your best and deal with it. You try to deal with it, right? You try to control the anger later. Well, then you're working hard on it. Be happy, do your best. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I become more aware that it's my ego. Yes, I understand, that's right. Manifesting I understand. Good, so you're at least aware you've got a good analysis, but don't turn it against yourself. That tends to be what we do, then you get guilty. Don't do that. Don't go there. Be glad that you're seeing it. Okay. Do you hear my point? Yes. I said, you should stop it there. You see it, you're uncontrolled, your heart beats fast, the words are coming out, your thoughts, but you think, okay, I'm seeing it at least. I'm seeing it at least. And I'll do my best. And you'd be very you'd be cautious with yourself and try to rejoice. You are making your best. You are doing, you are making effort, aren't you? Aren't you? Yeah. Be happy about it. I'm really serious. No, I understand. It's just I wish I didn't have to. I know, but you're doing it one step at a yeah. time. I know, I know. <laughs> I understand. But you're doing okay. One step at a time. Right. Time to go home. No, it's not time to go home. Another half an hour. I've got to shout for another half an hour, do I? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Any other questions online here? Anybody anywhere? No? Somebody? Cyril has a question. Cyril, where's Cyril? Okay, Cyril, talk to me, sweetheart. Talk to me, Cyril. Uh, hello, dear Venera Bobina. Yes, yes I, have a, I have a question concerning uh, the meditation when we watch our thoughts. Yeah. So, uh, for example, um, if uh, there is a thought uh, of uh, something like anger, for example, um, and, and I do not watch it, so the, the karma is recorded, uh, is it, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was recorded. Go on. What do you mean, Cyril? Hang on a second. Give me the context here. Are you sitting on your context? cushion? Are you driving the car? Are you in the kitchen when this happens? Give me a bit more framework. It can be, uh, for example, on the cushion or on, on daily life, for example. Yeah. Uh, for example, if I have a thought, uh, for example, that uh, I, I've been rejected, for example, something like that. Yes. And it's, a, it's not a comfortable thought. Yes. If, but if uh, I am watching uh, the thought yes. at this time, my question is, um, what's happening? Is uh, is it uh, a purification? I understand your point. It's a very good point, actually. It's a very good point. Okay, this, so let's say, you know, you're my friend and I'm upset because my, you know, because mean, ugly Jeremy just rejected me, okay? My mean, ugly boyfriend Jeremy has just hurt me. And I come to you as my friend and there's two scenarios. So listen, the first scenario is, and you know, Jeremy, you know, he's a creep as well. Do you understand? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and you go, yeah, I understand, Rabina. And I get angry, I get angry, I get angry. And you agree with me. And by the end of one hour, I've increased my anger four million times. That's called getting angry. The second scenario is I'm trying to work on my mind and I come to you crying and I tell you the scenario and then you're there to listen and to help me understand my mind and I'm struggling to deal with my anger. That's not anger. That's me working with my anger. It's a very different scenario. So we shouldn't be scared of the thoughts arising because they come out of great habit. But if you're just observing, wow, well, that's anger, and you're not buying into it and not increasing the conversation, then we shouldn't be scared of it. It just arises because the habit is so strong. That The second one is not anger. That's me trying to work it out and you helping me work it out. That's great. That's called practice. Do you understand? Uh, I think I what understand. You doubt? And, uh, What's your doubt? I understand. Sorry. What's your doubt? My doubts are not because I, I did not understand the sentences at the beginning. But I okay. think I, okay. I get the idea. Uh, the idea is that if I'm working on my mind, then it means uh, it's good. I mean, it's uh, it's not uh, the anger is not 
He's if reduced. you're working on your like my second scenario, there's my boyfriend Jeremy, and I do live with him, and he was mean, but he does his best. And I'm trying to look at my mind, and you are helping me do that. And I might be crying and telling you how upset I am, but that's not the same as just being angry. The first scenario is, is me coming and shouting and yelling and believing that Jeremy is bad and believing he's horrible. That's increasing anger. But talking about a problem and struggling with it and owning it, that's not being angry that's called practice because we can't just make all thoughts go away Cyril they're they're ancient they're deeply ingrained in us yes that's what that's why uh, that's what I, I was uh, wondering can the anger uh, be removed uh, hmm? I mean um, remove when what for example for example if for sometimes I reduce the anger because uh, something made me angry then uh, It will, it will come back, for example, in one year. Well, listen, Cyril, attachment and anger, attachment and anger and all the other, other delusions are so primordially deep in our mind. They're ancient. They're lifetime, Buddha would say. They're lifetimes old. They're, that's why they're so habitual. That's why they're so automatic. That's why you don't have to invite the thoughts to come into your head, like shouting and yelling every minute, because they're so ancient. So the practice is first to identify them and then to even, even to be able to remove ourselves and observe them, see them. It's very difficult. And then, but don't buy into them. Eventually they'll only go once you've realized emptiness, Cyril. You can't oh, okay. just disappear. Anger won't go before you've given up attachment and attachment doesn't go until you've realized emptiness, you know? So it's a way to go. It's a process, a process, Cyril. Okay. So... Oh, yes, I understand. Which means that uh, I cannot really uh, remove it uh, before emptiness. No, darling, no way. It's a gradual process of lessening, 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 weakening, weakening. Okay, so we can weaken it little by little, yeah. It's, it's a process. One's, it's, you don't suddenly lose 40 kilos the next day after you've been to the gym. It's a gradual process. Okay. Attachment and anger. Every time you work on your mind, every time you do your purification, every time you even control your speech, you're weakening the tendency to be angry. You're weakening the tendency to be jealous. It's a gradual, slow, slow process, Cyril. It's a very conscious process. Do you understand? Okay. Yes, I know. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. In the What else, people? So this is why uh, alone I'll come. This is why all of us we have to be. And I keep saying to you, same pattern every time. We are doing our best, you know, we are doing our best, but we tend not to be, we tend to always think we're not doing enough, we're not good enough, we haven't achieved enough. We always look at what we haven't achieved instead of looking at what we have achieved. And we have to do that if we are practicing and we all are doing our best. So we've got to rejoice in our progress. And that means we've got to have courage to see our crazy minds. We, we're so scared of our anger and our jealousy and our attachment, we want to make it all go away so we can pretend. And that's the worst thing possible. But when we know not to be scared of the thoughts, because buying into them, making them real, that's what increases them. But seeing them and working with them, that's completely different. That's called practice. So even you seeing your anger, And your heart even shaking, but you are observing it, you know what it is, and you struggle to work with it. That's incredible practice. You've got to accept that. If you just bought into the anger, like most people do, and never try to change it and really believe they're right, that's the absolute view. And that's how that's what being angry really looks like. Do you understand? We've got to know this. We've got to know this, I tell you. That means you've got to be brave, not just, you know. To, oh, I'm a Buddhist, I'm such a holy person. We just suppress everything. It's impossible to do that. You can't do that. That's worse. Yes, Alona. Krita, talk to me. Hi, Vinyava. Hello, darling. Nice to, to see, see you. you. Yes. <laughs> um, I was the, 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 the lately, you know, I'm watching uh, what's going on in the world and, you know, in my family and I, it just, It, it, it have so much I have so much fear and disheartening watching what's happening which the, part of the world are you talking about because if you look at some little village all of it oh you mean your whole like, world is bad or are you which would you read in the newspaper come on the ones like that you know like every time I watch the news and it it just 
it, it just getting worse and worse everywhere and people are getting slaughtered everywhere. It just, the it just breaks. Worse. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to disagree, but I'm sort of slightly arguing. I am slightly arguing. I know what you're saying. So when you're reading about the bad things like war and violence and, you know, fanatic politicians, sure, they're getting worse. So what's the question, darling? How do I deal with, it's, it's, uh, I get too much fear, you know, like I, 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 it's, I lose some hope for humanity. Like, it's just so disheartening. How do I work with that in my mind? I'm really surprised you're asking, because I think you know the answer. You're a really good practitioner. I've known it's, you for many years. So why don't you I, give the answer that somebody else, that you'd give someone else when they ask you that question? You know the answer already. So pretend someone else is asking you that very question and now you can please give them the advice. What would you advise them, Alona? Well, I would advise to, um, you know, uh, work on, on your own mind and uh, um, that's all you can do, right? But that um, person doesn't know what that means. So what do you mean? What do you mean, work on my mind? When there's a war in Ukraine, what are you talking about, work on my mind? What a load of rubbish. So please give me some more. Well, I was, I was thinking, you know, there is that uh, um, uh, uh, ignorance and anger and people don't get what they want. So they kill the other people because of their ignorance. So I see this plays out, you know, um, I can see this in my own mind. So I can okay, see so how it's in a bigger advice, scale. You're talking to yourself. You're, trying, you're pretending I'm a person who's got a problem and I've seen the suffering in Ukraine and I'm asking you, how do I deal with it? So please, what's your advice to me, Alona? Well, you cannot do anything about it. You just have so to... Have to uh, well, it, my advice, well, what, what you can't do anything about it. Just do what you can in your life. Like You don't suggest I have compassion for all the suffering people? Yes, that's... That, of well, that's a good piece of advice, isn't it? I mean, yes. you can't go to Ukraine. So, you, so basically, back to you. If you can't change these awful scenarios you're reading about in the news, if you can't change them, first you should have the wish. First you should see straight away, oh, my God, look at the suffering, which is what you're saying, isn't it? And that's called compassion, Alona. Then you would say, well, what can I do to help? That's your next step. Forget the fear, okay? Keep the fear out of the way. So what happened? This is the, these are the steps. It's very clinical, but this is how you practice. So you being having the Buddha's path, I'm saying this to you purposely. So you see this suffering. So you've based you've studied the Buddha's teachings. You're trying to practice them. You know this analysis about oh my God, there is suffering. So then the first step from the compassion point of view is you first have compassion because you see they're both they're harming each other. Would you agree with that? They're harming yeah. each other and themselves by killing each other. Would you agree with that? Yes. Everywhere you see suffering on the planet, it's going to be people harming themselves and each other. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So then and maybe it's just people who are starving, you know? So you'd have compassion, which goes, oh, my God, look at that suffering. And then the next step, which is great compassion, would be, well, is there something I can do? Do you understand me? Yes. Do you understand me? But what yep. you're doing instead, you say, oh, my God, look at the suffering. And then you get, then you, then you start becoming fearful. And so you bypass the second step. But you've got to learn to, and this is my advice to you, if you're trying to be a Buddhist, you train yourself to go to the next step, which is, is there something I can do to help? So mostly, you would argue, there's probably nothing. You can give $10 to a, a charity for the poor people. That's something. That's already one action. You can't yes. go to Ukraine. If you can be a mediator to the Ukrainians and the Russians or the Palestinians and the Israelis, well, honey, go for it. But if you can't, that's when fear comes. But if you've got, if you have, and I know you have, got the Buddhist analysis, then the next step would be, instead of fear, you'd give yourself the analysis of why it's happening. And you have that analysis. It's yes. called karma. And then you um, put that analysis in. In other words, you, you sort of like, to me, the analogy is this. You decide you're going to go to the war zone, to the, to the doctors without frontiers. Isn't it called that? Doctors without borders. Okay. And you decide to go to help. And you rush in and you go into the tent, but you don't have any wisdom. You haven't learned how to be a nurse or a doctor. You don't have wisdom, which means you don't know how to interpret all the suffering. Are you hearing me point now? Yes. So you don't know how to analyze the broken legs. You don't have any methods because you have no wisdom. So naturally, all you'd have was fear, wouldn't it be? Yeah. You hear me? 
Yes. So the analogy is the same here. But you've got some wisdom, Alona. You've been studying and practicing every day. And that's so then the so the first thing is you go, you walk into that tent, you go, is there something I can do? So if you can even apply a band-aid, you do that much. At least you do something, and then you won't have a mental breakdown. And now, if you're really wise and you realize emptiness and you're a body sufferer, then you can go, you're you like a, a trained doctor or nurse and you will not have fear at all because you have techniques to help and you will go in and you will do what you can. So keep working on your mind. And when you see suffering that you can't do anything about, you, then the next step, can I do something? And the answer is no. The next step is, well, I'll do something that I can here and help the dog and help my husband and help the next door neighbor do something. And then you'll say, and I'm going to continue to practice getting wisdom and getting bodhicitta. So eventually I am qualified to help. And you just keep practicing. That's the steps. It's all in the lamb rim laid out, but you haven't kind of, you forgot to follow them. Are you communicating with me? Yes. Yes. There's nothing else you can do except keep going and do what you can. And my feeling is, instead of feeling hopeless and having fear, even if you help the dog next door, you help one ant, that gives us courage. We do something. You maybe can't fix Ukraine, but you help a problem next door. You help one sick person. We do something according to our capacity. And that helps one person, but it gives us courage to, ne to not give up alone. Mm. Are we communicating? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you so much. What else, people? Anything else? Any questions? I mean, it's all tough stuff, isn't it? It's all difficult. We're discussing the whole path here, you know? We're discussing the whole path. Yeah. That's the point about first deciding when we started with. If you don't have enough wisdom because your mind is so fragile to handle grandma, and this is not your story, Jeremy, yours is different, you know, then you really have to, you know, then if you can, base one, if you're not completely crazy, you decide, okay, I can't really handle it, I'll be annoyed and irritated, but, you know, I'll just go. And you leave, you do what you can. You leave your ego at the door and you let grandma shout and yell and be neurotic. Let her be neurotic. It's okay. And that's a big one. This is the point here, you see. Our, because we're so fragile with our attachment that's there all the time, only wanting everything to be nice. That's what trauma and anxiety are. And as soon as, you know, he sees the chicken bones and thinks of the person who must have done it, then off he goes rampant on his stories, you know. So we, we're so fragile. We are really fragile. Life throws us. Not to mention seeing the war in Ukraine, you know. So this is why the wisdom wing is the first level where you make your own mind strong. So in his scenario, he knows there's going to be chicken bones. He knows it's going to happen. So he makes his mind strong by learning to know, okay, I'll keep my attachment under control. And if I see the chicken bones, I'll accept it. I'll just see it for what it is. I can't change it. I mean, can you change it? Can you tell this guy to stop? Or you don't want to do that? Because you could do that. Well, there, there are things I can do. I was thinking of putting a sign. I was thinking of talking to my super. Or I was thinking I could just go and clean and, it up. See, that's okay. There you go. This is the one. This is the one that's really powerful. Like when people, I mean, this is what happens in relationships. You know, well, you, you know, he doesn't do the dishes. Why should I do it? And then all this tension builds up. So if you're really courageous, that would be the perfect step. And you might be surprised that you won't see any more chicken bones. That's a really powerful, that's a very courageous one. That's a really courageous one. Give it a go and then see what happens. Because that, that is a huge shift in your mind. That would be very good for you, really courageous and brave of you to do that and kind. And don't be surprised. Suddenly it might shift. Do you understand? Very, that's a really good point. Well done. Tell us next time. <laughs> but that, see, Ukraine's a bit more difficult, isn't it? <laughs> that's the thing. So one step at a time. One step at a time, people. What else? <laughs> Quarter two. Come on, what else? Ask me some questions. Any more questions, people? Nobody have any questions? Oh. Go on, sweetheart. I just thought of so when I was telling her about my anxiety. Yes. One of the, <laughs> one of the ways I, I decided to cope with it was yeah. was uh, 
you know, I was I was faking. This is what it is, and I accept it. There you go. And it eventually goes away. That's right. Exactly. But it, it does happen a lot. I but, understand. But I thought what I realized it was like if I struggle with it, it makes it worse. Struggle with it as opposed to what, how does that look? Struggle meaning. So, so you know, I, I went to my doctor and she was giving me this whole story about my high blood pressure. Yeah, that's right. And so when my heart was raised, I keep thinking, I am shortening my life. Okay. And so I get I get the fear and the panic. Yes, yes. You know, and also, like, if I get the aversion, oh, this shouldn't be happening. That's right, that's right. I blame these people. That's blah, right, blah, that's right. As opposed to, this is happening. That's right. And how it will eventually go away. That's right. And if I don't, you know... If I don't sure, sure, sure. That's right. Make so it. you manage to do that sometimes? Sometimes. Well, keep going. Because you see, what the thing is, what we've got to realize is, forget the other person. They might be a creep. They might be really being mean, you know. it's This is for our own sake. It's like taking a pill. You do it for your sake. It's a method. It's not a moral thing. It's for one's own, it's for just one's own sake. You understand? We can see that. It's being kinder to ourselves. And then you, but you've got to rejoice in your, you never do that. I know this all the time I've known you. You never think to rejoice in your effort. You always see what you haven't achieved yet, but you've got to see that you've really come a long way. Do you agree with that? Do you agree? Yeah. Well, say it to yourself. Pat yourself on the back. Because that helps. That really helps, I tell you. Yeah. Said all the time. It's sort of like I joke about the same as you're practicing music and you pass grade one. And first you would rejoice, oh, then you go, I'm only in grade one. Then you think, well, I'll be good if I get better if I get in grade two. But of course, you're never satisfied. So I'm only in grade two. And then you get to grade 997. I'm only in grade 909. How about rejoicing each step of the way and look forward to the next step? That's a very different view. Be more encouraged. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, people. I know it's early. I'm always cheating you of time, but there's nothing. <laughs> time to go. Well, why don't we just watch our little minds for five minutes? We'll do a little contemplating the mind for five minutes. Okay. So what we'll do, huh? Question. What? Where? Mm -hmm. Hello, Elizabeth. Talk to me, sweetheart. Talk to me. Hi, Venerable Rowena. Good to see oh, you. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about the the couple of last comments and how interesting it is when we are, find ourselves in a moment of uh frustration or whatever we're yeah. doing somebody else's dishes or we're yeah. taking somebody else's chicken bones That's right, exactly. and to to step back again and and look at our um motivation for yes. doing it yes because there are times when i think a little bit of like pollyanna oh i'm doing this so nicely for yeah that other person but that's i realized right. it's yeah. for myself no that's right but but I have to be careful. I mean, I have to look I think at that's it. A really, no, Elizabeth, that's a really good point. And that's especially going to happen if in a family situation where you're seen to be a good girl. I mean, you know, the chicken bone one, he's not going to be seen by anybody except himself to be a good boy. So that would be a valid reason. But there's a big danger with some people, especially mothers and their boys or mothers and their children. You know, you, you run around picking up their rubbish, thinking you're being kind, where it's much more beneficial for the other person to leave the dishes dirty until they finally give up and wash them. That takes a lot of courage. You I, I agree. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. That's really, that's a kind of, that's an extra level of kindness. That takes courage, though. Wow. Right. right. Doesn't it? Thanks. Shoot? <laughs> yes. Okay. So just sit just for a few minutes, get your body really relaxed. Don't, just sit well sit upright actually it's important if you're in a chair don't slump into the chair sit upright but the muscles relax with the body upright hands in the mudra of meditation if you want in your lap like this just sitting be feel very natural okay and you have a head slightly tilted forward and feel very natural and relaxed and for just about five minutes maybe three we'll see we're simply going to pay attention to whatever pops up in our mind. So your attention, sort of notice, attention is like one thing and everything else is something else, like you're watching. So just have this attention, very focused. Don't kind of, it's sort of like there's about a hundred people shouting outside your front door. You don't go to, you're not going to get involved in the conversation. You're just going to observe what they're saying without comment, 
no involvement, let them say whatever they like, let the words come and let the words go. Except the thoughts, the, th the words out are the head in your head. Let the thoughts come and let the thoughts go. But stay alert and just pay attention. That's it. And I'll remind you every minute. That's it. Just watch. Keep the alert, keep the attention sharp. Don't space out. It's easy to do that. Just keep it sharp. Keep it sharp and alert. Just watch. Thoughts come, thoughts go. And sometimes it feels like there's no thoughts there. Don't worry about it. Just keep alert. Just watch. And space out. Stay clear and sharp. Was about three minutes. Okay, just relax. So that's easy when the thoughts aren't raging. So if you're sitting on there really upset at this moment, it's very hard to do that because you feel so absorbed into the thoughts, isn't it? But that's the practice, you know, to try attempt to watch them without getting involved. It's the simplest way to put it. So if you feel the anger there, something's happened or just rises up out of nowhere, you know, sometimes can. Just have another part of yourself like watching and hear it, identify it. It's hard not to be involved and it's hard not to have a conversation and to keep the anger going. But attempt to do that. It's very, very powerful. And don't be scared of it. Because, you know, the habits are so deep and the thoughts come uninvited. That's very clear. They come raging up, you know. And the point about this observing the thoughts, our trouble is in daily life, we're so used to just absorbed, being absorbed in the external action, the cars, the road, the kitchen, the person. When we know the thoughts are there, we're not noticing. And the only time we ever really notice the thoughts is when they're raging, and then it's a bit late. So this skill we're developing, even having a five-minute practice in the morning of merely watching your breath, merely watching your thoughts, is that you bring that skill to bear when you get off your cushion, and you've cultivated the habit to step back. 
So there you are in the kitchen, like my simple example, and there's your hubby slurping his coffee again. Normally you'd just absorb into that and get angry, but now you catch the anger rising in as thoughts before it becomes too emotional. And it's at that level you can argue with it, you know, like we'll be talking about the chicken bones, and you can change the story. That's called practice, and it's miraculous. It's amazing to do that because you've got some awareness, you know. Most of the world, I mean, we don't, it's not being rude. We don't do that. We just we just believe whatever we see. You know, we think we're right. So give ourselves a pat on the back. We try our best. You know? That's it, people, for today. Chang chup sem chow rumbo che ma ke panam ke yu chi ke panyang pa me pa yang gong ne gong du ka wa shou ge wa di nyu du dag lama sangye dru gyu ne dru wa chi kyang ma lu pa de yi sa lo ge pa shou. That's it, people. Thank you so kind. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for being a good example. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Somebody was going to say hello to me, wasn't it? Are you here? Who wants to talk to me? Somebody was going to talk to me. Oh, you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you.